The essence of nine-year-old Elizabeth Olton can be summed up by the words of those that knew her, that she was respectful and shy. But once she warmed up, she was sweetness and light made of sugar and spice. She loved her theater class. She loved her cats. Her favorite color is pink, and she wore the label of girly girl proudly. A small-town girl from St. Martin's, Missouri, which was the epitome of small-town America, barely breaking the 1,000 population mark. So if you applied the cliché for small towns, that everyone knows everyone, then everyone knows Elizabeth. And if they didn't, they would by the end of October 21st of 2009. Elizabeth, after leaving her friend's house, went against two of her biggest fears that evening. Being described as a very cautious child, she would never readily veer into the unknown. But this day, she strangely found her way into the woods. She was also incredibly afraid of the dark, but remained in those woods as the night fell. But she wasn't alone. Another young girl was there with her. And if you'd like an idea of how different two girls can be, here's Elizabeth's bedroom. Now here's the other girls. Complete polar opposites, wouldn't you say? And this other girl would have nothing but the worst intentions for Elizabeth. My name is Killian, and welcome to True Crime Stories. Let's rewind one hour earlier that day. Elizabeth was at home with her mother Patty when there was a knock at the door. It was their six-year-old neighbor named Emma asking if Elizabeth could come over to her house and play. Despite the three-year age gap, the two girls had become good friends and played with each other often. Elizabeth asked her mother anxiously if she could. Patty looked at the time. It was already 5 p.m., nearing dinner and nightfall. But seeing her daughter's eager face, she said that it would be okay if she promised to get back at 6 and take her cell phone. Elizabeth promised she would, so Patty, knowing that a promise from her daughter was as good as gold, watched the two girls happily trot away. Here's the route they took to get to Emma's house, which is about a 5 minute walk. Emma and Elizabeth were playing in the front yard when suddenly, Emma maybe because she was just six, went off and left Elizabeth all alone. But Emma's older sister, 15-year-old Alyssa, maybe feeling bad for Emma's rudeness, came outside to keep her company. As 6 p.m. approached, Elizabeth, remembering the promise to her mother, told Alyssa goodbye and started walking home. That would be the last time anyone saw her alive again. When six o'clock struck, Patty already had a bad feeling when Elizabeth wasn't already inside the house. She called her cell phone and no one answered and called it again countless times as her anxiety grew with every second. After 45 minutes of waiting, looking down the street and redialing, she called the police. In a small town like St. Martin's, when one of their daughters goes missing, the police, as well as the locals, will come out in droves. 300 volunteers combed over the dense forest, which proved tricky with ponds and damp conditions. It was a full-scale search for nine-year-old Elizabeth Olton. But where in this environment could a young girl have gone? The two girls' homes were about a quarter of a mile apart, if you choose to walk the path, though it could be made even shorter if you cut through some woods. But Patty knew her daughter. Given Elizabeth's proclivities towards safety, she told authorities that she would never ever entertain cutting through those woods. Nevertheless, they searched throughout the day, pressed on through the night, and did not stop looking even as a new day began. The FBI would eventually get involved and elevated the search with dive teams and helicopters. The registry of offenders in the area was opened and each would be questioned. And then something chilling happened when Elizabeth's phone data 
was accessed, her phone was still on, and it was pinging in the vicinity of her home. Law enforcement would immediately head out to find that phone, but the battery would soon deplete and the pinging would stop as the search continued into night number two. The following day, FBI investigators would again be canvassing Emma and Alyssa's property as it was the last known sighting. Then something interesting happened when six-year-old Emma wanted to talk to them. She wanted to tell her story again, but this time would include some crucial details she purposely omitted. This would begin the unraveling of what happened to Elizabeth Olton. So according to Emma, Elizabeth coming over to play wasn't her idea at all. Her older sister Alyssa told her to go invite her friend over. So when she and Elizabeth were playing in the front yard, the reason why Emma abruptly left was because again, she was told to by her older sister. She watched Alyssa and Elizabeth walk away together. When investigators asked why she left this out the first time, Emma said that Alyssa told her to. So after the older girls effectively ditched Emma, she continued playing by herself, but then she would wind up falling into a rose bush trying to retrieve a hair tie and was so entangled she wasn't able to get free. She frantically cried out for help for quite some time, but Alyssa would eventually come to her rescue. But it was here that Emma said she noticed that there was blood on Alyssa's jeans on the mid thighs. Alyssa told her that she had just gotten her period and not to tell anyone. And since that day, her little six-year-old conscience knew something was weird. She was really worried about her missing friend and just wanted to help find her. Things were starting to look very strange and it would get outright disturbing when two days later, the search party found what they described as a rectangular hole. And I understand they didn't want to make assumptions, but that's a straight up child sized grave. There wasn't a body in it, but it sure appeared someone planned to put one in eventually. Alyssa at this point, assuming the FBI would figure it out anyways, told them that it was her that dug that hole. She said it was a hobby of hers to just dig holes as if it was something common for bored teens to do. I could imagine a few eyebrows raising when you hear something like that in a missing persons investigation. So warrants were issued and Alyssa's home was thoroughly searched. The house itself wasn't out of the ordinary until they got to Alyssa's room. Even without context, you just knew something was wrong with this occupant. Who needs a hamper when you just discard your clothes exactly where you take them off? Same idea goes to trash cans, several empty Mountain Dews, multiple drinking glasses, even a can of whipped cream just to accent the mess. Whatever found its way to the floor apparently found its new home. So who does shit like this? And could it really be possible that her parents have never seen her room? The answer is actually yes. For the first seven years of Alyssa's life, she witnessed abuse and was herself abused in unmentionable ways. Her mother was heavy into drugs and her dad was serving 10 years for assault. It's probably an understatement to say that it was complete chaos in that household. But she would have a saving grace when her grandparents, Karen and Gary Brooke, gained custody of Alyssa when she was 7 years old and gave her stability for the first time in her life but it was starting to show that there was still no stability in her mind. So aside from the fact that her room is a disheveled mess, she also disturbingly wrote and drew on the walls making investigators feel they were searching the room of a mental patient. The most ominous drawing was a figure they described as bleeding with cuts and the name next to it was Emma. Now keep that in mind and the size of the grave she had dug. And you might lose a little sleep tonight. Now let's watch the interrogation footage of 15 year old Alyssa Bustamante adjusting her story after her little sister ruined her alibi. The footage is courtesy of one of my favorite true crime channels called Explore With Us. I will link their two hour video in the description where they dissect Alyssa's interrogation expertly. 
The moment Alyssa took a seat, she would bob up and down just like this without pause. A nervous tick, perhaps. Her hands also remain clasped, which body language experts would interpret as stress and frustration. So off the bat, Alyssa did sense something was wrong, that she was here to tell her story again. So being a minor, she needed a guardian in the room with her. That would be her grandmother Karen, sitting on the bottom of your screen. The woman next to Alyssa is Toby Meyer, a juvenile counselor, and the man at the table is Detective David Rice. We didn't go to seminary that day, right? Okay, so I woke up and I got ready and I went out to go get the bus, but I missed the bus because it doesn't usually pick me up. Okay. So I went back to the house and my grandpa gave me a ride to school. So I went to school. Okay. And I was there all day. And then I came home on the bus and I got home around three. No, four. Three thirty. Three thirty. Four. I get home around then. And I just hung out in my room for a little while. And then I went for a walk around five, four thirty, five, something like that. So I was just walking around in the forest for a while. And I was supposed to take my little sister with me, but I ditched her because she's annoying. Okay. And I was just walking around in the forest and then for about an hour. I came back around 5.36ish, and I went up in my room, and I heard, like, yelling. So I went outside, and I, like, she was down in the, like, ditch area. She was stuck in thorn bushes. So I went down there, and I helped her out. And she asked me why I was waiting because, you know, I found out on my period. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah, don't tell me about that. And so we went out there. And my brother and Andy they were asking about her because they supposed, she was supposed to be at home or something. Okay. And I didn't really think much of it. So we just went back to the house and then started to get ready to go to church because we have Wednesday night activities. Okay. And he came and he's like, he was pat on the door. And he was like, do you know where my is? Because he couldn't find her. And that's when things started to get, you know, people were like, oh, what's going on? Like, where is she? But we ended up going to church. And I don't know, a lot of stuff happened while we were there. Because it's from 7 to 8.15-ish. And when we came back, there was three sheriff cars in our property. And there was people out searching everywhere. Uh-huh. And, um... That's pretty much it. I went to sleep after that. Okay. I, I'm going to ask you because I ask everybody. Mm -hmm. Did you do anything to her? No. Did you cause her disappearance? No. Did you kill her? No. Okay. Do you know where she's at right now? No. Okay. I'm new to this. Mm -hmm. I, um, so, was playing with That's my understanding. And when was that? Oh, they were sometime after I had gone in the forest because I guess I just decided to go over it with the bits. Oh, uh, after you ran away, yes. she went to find somebody new to play with. It's pretty hard not to notice that Alyssa is a human bobblehead. Whether conscious or subconscious, it appears that she is trying really hard to make herself believe her own story, to be as convincing to her small audience as possible. I must add that she does love her grandparents immensely. She wants her grandmother to believe her story as much as she wants Detective Price to. Now, it's my understanding that uh, did the FBI do a search or something of, of the house where you guys lived? Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. What, what was that all about? Um, they searched our house, I guess, for any signs. Of and they found stuff in the room. But not like evidence like that. They had like marijuana seeds. And, <laughs> and you understand, I don't care about marijuana seeds or any of that. And they found uh, less. my medication. Yeah. Don't care about that. Yeah. That's not what we're here about. Has it ever been in the house? 
I mean, she, she's coming she over to visit with Emma. House, yes. Yeah, I assume if she's a neighbor girl, she's probably been over there, so uh, not a big deal there. So mm -hmm. um, you said they searched your room. Yes. Other marijuana seeds and that sort of stuff. Did they did they find anything? Nope. Okay, did they take anything? Um, they took my sheet and okay. a pillowcase, I okay. think. Did they take anything else? Um, I don't think so. I haven't really surveyed anything. Okay. Okay. I think they took clothes. No, oh, they took a pair of hands. Okay. And a diary. You must know that Detective Price, just before the interrogation went underway, was given Alyssa's diary that was confiscated from the search. Alyssa had no idea they had found it because she felt it was safely hidden. Not from the FBI, apparently. Price kept that information in his back pocket until he felt it was time to reveal it. But Alyssa's grandmother, unknowingly, reveals it for him. So they took a pair of hands. Okay. And a diary. Mm -hmm. I mean, they gave us the list. I it's not all coming. This still shot captures the moment that Alyssa realizes that the FBI had her diary and the magnitude of its contents. It would prove both extremely sadistic and revealing. Detective Rice, looking back at Karen after she stole his thunder, no longer has to carry on the charade of friendly neighborhood cop. Did you know that? No. Does it make you angry? Oh, yeah. It's kind of your private private, personal thoughts, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, I think I'm just embarrassed because they find that out. Embarrassing probably isn't the word detectives would use when they read her diary. It's more of a gateway into Alyssa's incredibly troubled mind. One excerpt read, If I don't talk about it, I bottle it up and I explode. Someone is going to die. This alongside expressing an urge to burn down a house with a family inside. But the most damning entry was dated on the same day Elizabeth disappears. Even if you write something down, yeah. it doesn't matter, let's say you write it down in pencil, and then you take a pen and try real hard to scratch it out. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make it go away. Okay. It's still there. And forensically, and actually you don't even need a whole lot of forensics. If you hold it up to a light, you can see what was written. The paragraph Detective Rice is alluding to that was crudely scratched out with blue ink read, I just fucking killed someone. I strangled them and slit their throat and stabbed them. Now they're dead. I don't know how to feel at the moment. It was amazing. As soon as you get over the, oh my god, I can't do this feeling, it's pretty enjoyable. I'm kind of nervous and shaky though right now. Okay, I gotta go to church now, lol. And then when that's processed, forensically, every word every stroke is still there. Do you hear me? Mm -hmm. What we want to do is find out what happened to the little girl. Okay. We have to know the truth. That's all I'm asking for is whatever happened. I have to know the truth. This is not going to go away. All I'm asking for is the truth. I don't know what's in the diary. I don't know the truth. That's what I'm asking. Tell us what happened. If this isn't, if this was an accident, that's fine. We can deal with that. But I have to know what happened. I have to know what the truth was. I have to know how this happened. And the most important thing is we have to know where she's at. We have to give this family some closure. Just like if this was your little sister, you would 
we want closure. This family needs closure. Okay. Let's start at the beginning. Is this something that was planned out or was this just an accident? It was an accident. Detective Rice baits her with an alternative to murder and Alyssa falls for it. Now he has her at the scene of the crime with the victim. Why don't we start with, why don't we start with what happened? I live in the forest, like I said. to go hang out because it was a nice day. We're just... Mess? Alyssa will have a hard time catching her breath, which can be a real reaction to being caught in a lie or a stall tactic to conjure up a story now that she's taken the accident route. To save you time as she struggles breathing, she tells the most basic of stories that she and Elizabeth went into the woods together and Elizabeth trips, falls backwards, hits her head, and dies. Now a normal person in this situation would run and find help, but Alyssa said she didn't know what to do, panicked, and burned the body. I'm sure making zero sense to anyone. This is all she could come up with in the moment, believing that the detective would buy the story that Elizabeth was nothing but ashes now and stop searching, which of course they wouldn't and they would eventually find Elizabeth Olton's body intact in a shallow grave. So I burned her body. We're out in the forest. <sighs> Still did it by the creek bed. By the creek bed? Yes. How did you burn her? Then just a bunch of wood. Started a fire. Burned her body. Why did you dig that hole? Was that good? Was that for her? Did you catch Alyssa's story falling apart? First she said she dug the hole for Elizabeth after she died. And then when Rice asked her if she dug the hole before she played with her, Alyssa said yes. The importance of when she dug the hole is the difference between manslaughter and premeditation, between 10 years in prison or life. It was Friday with the shovel. As her own lies start to confuse herself further, she would come clean on when she dug the hole later in the investigation. Friday with a shovel was five days prior. She had murder on her mind for quite some time. Now we're about to see the most heartbreaking scene because Karen, who's been trying her best to stay strong, to stand by her granddaughter's story, will no longer be able to hide from the facts when Detective Rice lays out the situation in such a calculated manner that Alyssa is compelled into revealing the most evil act that day. It doesn't matter whether the body's burned or not. They'll go through and do an autopsy. Okay. And they will 
discover every injury on her body and the cause of death. And, and I understand you said she fell, and that's why she died. However, they will know from the autopsy if she was shot, if she was hit in the head, if her throat was cut. They will know all of that from the autopsy. So we need, we need to know the truth because at the end of the autopsy, they will know exactly how she died. So we need to know now the full truth, full disclosure right now. So it doesn't come out later that, well, it wasn't telling the full truth again. How did she kill her? I didn't. She died. How did she die? Nine-year-old girls don't just die. You were really the mess of your head. But she fell back and hit her head. Was her throat cut? Yeah. Oh. After confessing, Alyssa will continue lying, even about things that were easily proven. How many times did you stab her? Two. Two. I think. She said she only stabbed the girl two times when the medical examiner discovered a total of eight stabs. Did you hit her with anything first? No. I, yeah, cut her throat. She died. She also left out that she strangled and beat the nine-year-old before using the knife. She also comically claimed that she dug the entire hole that she put Elizabeth in with the knife. Just highlighting the fact to everyone that Alyssa was a habitual liar and a cold-blooded murderer. Alyssa Bustamante was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole plus 30 years for an armed criminal action, just two weeks shy of her 18th birthday. She would make a final statement to the family of Elizabeth Olton. If I could give my life to bring her back, I would. I just want to say I'm sorry for what happened. You know, the typical bullshit murderers say. It didn't bring any relief for the grieving family to hear anything from Alyssa. A heartless waste of oxygen who spent most of her time at the trial, looking around the courtroom, looking blankly at the families, disinterested, bored, showing no signs of remorse, just void of humanity. If anything, her final words just made Elizabeth's family hate her more, and her mother Patty said as much in her impact statement that Alyssa is an evil monster, and she hated her. Elizabeth Olton's memorial was held just a week after she went missing. 
Her funeral was accented by beautiful pink balloons as she would have loved as her heartbroken family laid her to rest. Her life ended needlessly and just reading what kind of child she was, that is the kind of kid I personally adore. Shy and innocent, respectful, who didn't have a malicious bone in her body. The kind of kid you don't see or even hear about much these days. So all the respect to those that raised her. Even though I never knew her, it's hard not to feel that the world was robbed of someone that could only make the world a nicer place, something this world surely needs more of. And in that sense, I will miss her. There's no way to imagine the pain her family is going through, and we could only hope they find the strength and support to continue on with her memory. My name is Killian. Don't forget to like and subscribe to support these videos. Much love to my Patreons, trying their best to keep the lights on. Continue to protect the ones you love, and love the ones that protect you.